we we'll pick up where we left off, shall we? And we're going to be taking a look at um, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And uh, there's this, we're picking up back and forth all the New Testament, as you know. Um, but we're going to pick up from our story here. At the end of 1 uh, Samuel 7, um, the, um, the ark was a problem for the Philistines. And they... Um, needed to be delivered from them. It was an incredibly bad situation in Israel's history. As you know, we're dealing in the time of the judges with a time of great chaos and confusion. And Samuel is, in fact, the one who's the connector between Israel uh, in terms of a, being a, 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 a monarchy, a, a theocracy, and now a monarchy. So he's the last of the judges and really the first of a school of prophets. And he's going to be the one who's going to anoint the first two kings of, of Israel. Uh, but before all this takes place, though, uh, these men took the ark of the Lord and they brought it into the house of Abinadab. So remember, they had this problem because it, uh, the ark was plaguing them and they wanted to get rid of it. And it, was, it remained there for a number of years. Um, and they kept the ark of the Lord. And then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, Remove the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth, which are these Canaanite deities that they had, uh, from among you. Direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Now, this is a huge statement he's making, because in this context here, they had pretty much rebelled against the living God. So here he's um, inviting them to do something. And I'm surprised to say to see that the sons of Israel removed them and served the Lord alone. For that, that lasted about a day. The reality is, though, that they were in a rebellious state before, Israel, before the living God. And still, in spite of their rebellion against him, in spite of the fact that they had turned to idolatry again and again, God continues to, re- to restore them and to, and to give them chances because he's a God of covenant grace. And he gives us more than we deserve. And so they gathered to Mitzvah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted. And they acknowledged that they had sinned against the Lord. And so the sons, Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mitzvah. And so when they heard that then, um, they were afraid of the Philistines. Uh, the lords of the Philistines came up against Israel. They were afraid. He says, don't cry to the Lord. Um, uh, don't cry for your own deliverance on your own, but you need to turn to the Lord your God. He'll save you. And so he offers this lamb, and as he's offering up this burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. Now, they were really inconquerable because they had iron, and they had these these chariots and so forth. They had a greater technology, and these were people who lived in the coastal areas here and were dominating and as were, were a complete plague which continued on even into the time of the uh, United Kingdom. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder in that day against the Philistines and confused them. So it was not them, but rather the living God who then delivered them. So they were routed before Israel, so that it was apparently something that God directly did on his own, on their behalf. And you'd think that they'd then get get the picture. He took a stone, in fact, and he set it between Mitzvah and Shen and named, named it Ebenezer. Just to give you an idea of where we are on this on the map here, um, you're looking here at a, at a portrait here of how there was this battle of Aphek over here, and that's where the ark was taken. And this, the various lords of the Philistines, would you see these, these cities here that I've marked here, and you can see you had Ekron, And then you had um, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Geza, and and Gath. And these were all the coastal areas of the Philistines. They were tremendously strong in their power. And what was taking place then was that this this battle that takes place, this uh, deliverance takes place here in in Mitzvah, right in this area here. And it was one of those cities that that Samuel, uh, rather, um, was... was, um, a part of, and so he would uh, be kind of like a, a circuit. So on this, in this context then, he delivers them, and the cities uh, were restored to Israel. 
And so Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines, so there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now, this was a little thing that, they, that he told them to put up there then, that there would be a, a, a stone of remembrance. And so they, they offered this burnt offering, and he said, take this stone and name it Ebenezer. Anyone know what that name means? Ebenezer? The Lord is our help. So it's, it's a stone of help, really. It's the idea of a stone of help. And it was a memory, a memorial for them that they would actually then remember that this is a place where God intervened and put that into their lives. And there they were to say, thus far, the Lord has helped us because they clearly saw that their enemies were beyond them and yet God still delivered them. Now, I'm astonished, really, by the uh, covenant grace of the living God, because, frankly, it's way beyond their desert and our desert. It continues to go on and amazes me that in spite of the many times that they rebelled against them in their arrogance and so forth, they still uh, were delivered by the living God. Because in, fact, in, fight of, in spite of their covenantal breaking, um, it was the living God then who supplied for them all, in, all they needed. And he gave them far more than they deserved because he gave them grace, which is what the nature of God is like. He's a God of covenant grace and uh, that he cares for us and he is intimate with us. My friend uh, Stuart McAllister was talking about um, a person who was raising questions about why would you make the claim that Christianity is better and, or has distinctive from other religions? What makes it different from other religions? What would be some examples of how it would stand against them? And there were three words that the fellow came up with that were intriguing to me. One was history, the second word was, was wound, and the third word was grace. And I was, I was intrigued by that idea. What do you mean history, wound, and grace? But the idea of history, and just to get, uh, get you a feel of the, the God we serve, it's a, it's a way of looking at this, really. So what you see here is in this understanding, when we look at history, other, uh, unlike uh, Buddhism and so forth, you have here a space-time historical connection with actual events and people archaeology and other things can uh, record this and, re and, re and show this, that it was embedded in history, in the history of humanity, and that God entered into history. He is the Lord of space and time. And so instead of being long ago and far away or some kind of a mythology, we're dealing with places and events that we can actually mark out on maps. The word wound, though, was an interesting one, because in this case, how does that make it different? It's the one who made the world, took the sins of the world upon himself. And so the idea of bearing our wounds, he himself bore our wounds in, on the cross. And then the, the third word, grace, which was interesting again, because I see no room for this elsewhere. Grace is the imagery here of a God who gives them more than they deserve. Remember the difference between mercy and justice and grace? Remember that? We've done this many times before. Well, justice is what? Getting what you deserve. Should you ask God for justice? I wouldn't try it. Because you want to say, God, I want what I deserve, but I want it now. Better not ask that question, you know, to make that demand, because you zap, you're going to be out of here. Um, instead, what are we asking for? Don't give me what I deserve. That's mercy. You see, um, the quality of mercy is uh, such that it gives us more than we deserve. Um, we do pray for mercy. That same prayer does teach us to render the deeds of, of mercy. So the, the whole idea, of, if, if salvation were based upon our performance, we'd be in serious trouble indeed. But no, don't ask for, 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 for justice. Ask for mercy, not getting what you deserve. And even better, what's the next word? Grace getting more than you deserve. And this is one of the themes that I have seen again and again is the whole idea of, of when we look at grace. I always mention this because I see this idea of gift and grace. The more you look at this at the gospel and the more you see him working throughout the history of the scriptures, gift and grace is what it keeps coming down to. And it gets bigger 
and it gets bigger because the reason for that is your perception is that everything you are, everything you have is by the grace and the gift of God. And so when we come to see that, then we realize one of the central themes of the entirety of Genesis to Revelation is the grace of God who gives us more than we deserve. And that is precisely what happens in our text here. So they were given this grace and this stone of remembrance was a marker for them to recall and to bring to their minds when this would take place. So there was peace. So he judged the Israel all the days of his life. He's used to go annually on circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzvah, and he judged Israel in those three places. And then his return to Ramah, his house was there, and he built an altar to the Lord. And going back to this, uh, in this map that we had before, um, we take a look here, and we see that was a kind of a circuit for, for him. So in this area here then, this is where he would actually go. It would, he would be in, in this area um, where he would go uh, mitz, mitzvah here, and then he would, um, and, and, and kind of like a circuit, and he'd work himself around, and back he'd go then to Rama, which was his, his, where he would be. And so he judged uh, the, 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 uh, the people of Israel for a number of years, although his sons would rule uh, and further south in Beersheba. I mention this because there's a sadness that takes place here in this story. And the sadness is that um, his, when Samuel was old, he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba, where further south as I just showed you there. But they didn't walk in his ways and turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Now I gotta say, does that remind you of anything? Should remind you of another story, because you remember Eli, who was the high priest, and his sons were totally disobedient and rebellious. And it's the same thing that's happening here. So there's no guarantee, and this is always the case where you have to recognize that I don't care how godly you are, it's going to be, you can raise children, uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be something that you cannot control the outcome. You see, you can be faithful to the process, uh, but there are going to be times when it does not turn out as we would wish. And we know that we're totally out of control here. You're trying to raise up a child and train them, but at the same time, you cannot control what their outcome will be. So what we do is we, uh, we do uh, before God, then we uh, serve our Lord, we seek to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and then uh, leave the outcome in God's hands. And there are some cases where some will turn out in one way and some in another way. I have to look to God. I cannot control another person's life. So I recognize how that drives me to dependence upon him because when things are out of control in my life, and often we'll, he will use, um, when, he, when we're seeking to actually do something that is serious and significant, on behalf of the kingdom of God, sometimes he'll attack us through our families. And sometimes it'll be those kinds of internal difficulties. In this instance though, we have to recognize that God is the one that we, we serve them, he, we, we love our children, but at the end, they're his. I can't, and God has no grandchildren. So I cannot actually cause them to believe uh, my, what I'm teaching. I can model it, I can be an exemplar, but at the end of the day though, I look to the Lord for the outcome. And there are times when you see very godly men and have ungodly children. I've seen the other way around. When you think about some kings who were wicked and who actually had righteous uh, uh, progeny. So it's in God's hands. But in this instance here, they were dis dishonest and, per and perverted justice. So as a consequence, the elders of Israel came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said, you know, you've grown old, your sons don't walk in your ways. Appoint a king for us to judge like all the nations. Now, this is actually a press that they wanted to have all along. They wanted to have some kind of a, a ruling authority, someone who is visible, palpable, manifest, that you could actually see. Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed, and the Lord said, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me from being king over them. A very significant statement. Why did they reject the theocracy? Why did they plump for a visible monarchy? They wanted a physical king that they could look at, who could lead them into battle, and to, and to carry on for them 
in a physical manifestation, even though the Lord your God was your king. And he goes on to say, and this gives a biblical commentary, like all the deeds which they have done since the day I brought them out from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they're doing to you also. So it's intriguing then. I, when I read the scriptures, you know, you want a different outcome. Have you ever had this occasion where you want a, a different outcome? You're reading Genesis 3 and you're hoping it's not going to happen. It's, but you know what's going to happen. But you also know the big story because you know how the story is going to go. It's going to go in a very different way than what we what might suppose. It's a, it's a great story. And you know about the four, the, the four acts. And so you have these four um, acts in, 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 in history here that God has actually um, done something that's quite remarkable in, in, the, in the, the various acts of God's work and his our creation, his fall, his redemption, his new creation. That in these acts then, he's made all things well. There's a fall, there's a distortion, but yet there's at the same time, the hope of the gospel that's right before us there. And ultimately we can anticipate a time in the ages to come where actually the, 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 he will bring about his righteous reign in his time and for his purposes. So I see then in these four acts then a bigger picture and he's looking at the whole rather than just the middle portion of it. And so in viewing that larger game, that larger plan, that larger purpose, I see then something bigger than what I would have myself have expected. It's a great story, a great story of redemption. But uh, that he even endures it is amazing to me. Uh, the more you learn about the living God who made all things and his majesty and his awe and his power and his greatness, um, the more unique you see his loving kindnesses and his compassion, you see the whole vision of a God who cares, a God who's only in the scriptures is he a covenant maker and a keeper. And he tells us that your life is about covenant, not just contract. You see, a covenant is where you're committing yourself to the best interests of another person. A contract is where you're protecting yourself from another person. Marriage is not a, co a contract. You see, it's a covenant. And so at the end of the day, then you and I are really are going to be shaped by the covenants we make with other people and the way we serve and treat other people in terms of a covenantal relationship. Here they have abandoned his covenant in spite of his yet another deliverance from them, from the bondage of the Philistines, where they saw that apparently there was some kind of a phenomenon that God, God brought about in the heavens that actually brought them down and, 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 uh, and caused them to uh, su su submit and to to, uh, they were defeated, they, were, they departed. So I amaze myself at when I see the grace of God in this way. And I recognize then that our lives are like this, where our lives are really the quality of our relationships, our commitments to other people, and ultimately to the living God. So when that's first and foremost, then everything follows its proper place. But they were told this is what's going to happen. And God was not surprised that they were going to clamor for this. He even said that, made provision for that. When you ask for a king, when you come back into the land, and this was during the time of Moses, hundreds of years ago, he says, this is the king you're going to need to get. And you shouldn't, shouldn't multiply wealth or women or power, but that's exactly what the kings would do. And so he warns them about this. And he says, look, here's what's going to happen. You want the procedure of a king? He's going to take your sons. He's going to place them for himself in his chariots. He's going to use them for his purposes. Uh, he's going to appoint for himself commanders of thousands and fifties. He's going to basically use them um, and you're going to be serving him in this way. He's going to take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He's going to take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves. You sure you want this? Give a tenth of your land to your vineyards and so forth. Is this what you're looking for? Um, because you want a visible king, he's going to take a tenth of your flocks. You're going to cry out in that day because of your king. But by that time, your Lord, the Lord's not going to answer you because you begged for a king and God gave you what you wanted. But it was, it's going to be uh, dust in your, in, in, uh, in your, uh, on your palate. You're just going to be ashes in your mouth because you're going to be having the thing you wanted is going to ruin you. How many times have you and I longed for something that would be our ruination? So many times I look at things of that nature and I have to recognize that great uh, line there, thank God for unanswered prayers, because there's a lot of things I would have been ruined if he'd given me what I wanted when I wanted it. I can assure you of that. However, it says, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. 
And they said, no, but there will be a king over us. In spite of what you've said, in spite of all of that, we want that. Why? Why did they want that kind of representation? Why was not God enough? And this is the whole issue. It has to do with what's visible and what's invisible. And even now, every day, we struggle against this. We, 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 as we age, we find that our, our, our vitality diminishes, and yet we still cling to that which is passing away rather than transferring our affections to that which is going to endure. It's so hard for us to cultivate an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. That we, so they wanted to have a king visible so that who would fight our battles. And it turns out, you don't know what you're asking for, and it would be a disaster for them. So after Samuel heard all the words of all the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. And the Lord, Samuel said, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice um, and appoint them a king. So he's allowing this to take place. And I find that to be quite remarkable. So when I look at this text of scripture then, I recognize the Lord said to Samuel, they have not rejected you, they rejected me from being king over them. So this is the biblical point of view and perspective, and it will be not to their good for this to occur. Um, and I, I think of these texts then, and in 1 Samuel 12, 12, I wanna jump ahead to that because it's most intriguing. If you jump ahead to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 12, and we're, we're gonna be seeing that a little bit in a few weeks, um, but I go to this text here because it gives us another perspective that um, Samuel later on addresses Israel. I've listened to your voice and all that, that, I, that you asked, said to me. I have appointed a king over you. Now this is the king walking before you. And so now he had appointed Saul. But I am old and gray. Behold, my sons are with me, and I've walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? This is a matter of his integrity. He hasn't defrauded anyone. But at the same time, it says, my Lord is, the Lord is my witness, and you found nothing in my hand. So then it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron. He brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. He's giving them a, a perspective, get a view of your understanding of your history. Take your stand that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did for you and your fathers. And he went out from, uh, Jacob went out from Egypt and brought your fathers, settled in this place. And they forgot the Lord their God. And so he gives them a review of all the kinds of things that they would do. They'd cry out to the Lord, we've sinned. We've served the Baals and the Ash. No, deliver us. And then he sent um, another deliverer. And then he sent another and another. And again and again, in spite of the fact that they, um, of their rebellion, they still uh, were served, saved by, by the living God. When you saw that Nahash, your, the king of sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. And here's the key phrase, although the Lord your God was your king. So that's exactly that phrase. Now, therefore, here's the king whom you've chosen, whom you've asked for. And he even says, in spite of the, your folly, even now, God can deliver you, but they will not do so. What is it about Israel that is like us? We can see there's a parallelism. It's very hard for us to see for us to treasure the things we know are going to endure. It takes no faith for me to believe that this, everything you own or think you own, everything you touch physically and so forth, it'll be out of your hands, it'll go. And uh, the, uh, all the things of this world, if this is all there was, I would be in great despair at this point in my life. But I do not despair, but actually I do not lose heart because I recognize that there's an eternal perspective that I need to cultivate in this, in this temporal arena. And it reminds me really of a couple of, of truths in scripture. One of them is Romans chapter 15, verse four, which gives us a, a point of view. And Romans 15 tells us about the relationship of even as we read these, these texts in the, in the Hebrew Bible, it tells us that whatever was written in earlier times, and this is in the Hebrew Bible, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So what we're seeing here is Paul is saying that the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, gives us a record of God's working with people and it gives us perspective on our times as well. Um, another text of, of, of scripture is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 11, because this is yet another very important New Testament perspective. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you can see that he describes 
here, use Israel as an example. Avoid their mistakes. In other words, we're learning, we're learning. So it's not just live and learn, it's learn and live, is the whole idea. So gain some perspective from your own history. And so he says, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and were all passed through the sea. He's referring to what? The great deliverance through the Exodus and the, and the deliverance under the, um, the, the cloud, the Shekinah glory, and the, and the way in which he protected them and dealt with them in spite of their, um, the enemies which were beyond them. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They were drinking from a spiritual rock. So he uses an allegory here of Christ, which was the rock. But with most of them, God was not pleased because they were laid low in the wilderness. So there were consequences to the rebellion. And then his summary is very important for me. In verse 6, it says, Now these things happened as what? examples for us. So when you read the Hebrew Bible, it is like a reminder. Remember what happened to them and let that be an insight and a perspective for yourself that we wouldn't crave the things that they craved. Um, Some of them were idolaters. Um, Don't let us uh, act immorally as some of them did. Let's not try the Lord as some of them did. We're destroyed by the serpents nor grumble as some of them did and we're destroyed by the destroyer. I got to tell you, um, it's so easy to do to succumb to that and to say when things are not going my way, you begin to grumble and gripe and complain rather than choosing gratitude and contentment. Because the only way you're going to actually have gratitude and contentment in this crumbling world is for you to see God's new plan, his new purpose, his new hope that the sufferings of this present time aren't even worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. So he says, this is critical, verse 11. All these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So when I read these stories about the Hebrew Bible and the stories about what they had to go through and experience, I'm constantly reminded of the fact that this is a story of really in another very real way of us Uh, because um, don't stand don't become arrogant but depend upon the lord god don't think you stand take heed that you don't fall no temptation and we're all being tempted in so many ways has overcome you or taken you which is but such as is common to man god's faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it so he speaks to them and flee from the folly of, of your own uh, forefathers and to restore and return and come back to him. Because if you come to understand, everything comes back to him. It comes back to the fact that uh, he, uh, in spite of the uh, various portions and ways and all these things that he's revealed, the most critical revelation of all is the, is the Lord Jesus the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, upholds all things by the word of his power. And so he is the one who gives us hope. He's the one who gives us purpose. He's the one who gives us um, a, a future. And that ultimately that we must depend upon him. So you see that I constantly return to this and re- this recurring message because in seeing this, this understanding is not losing heart, but ma- maintaining our vision and transferring it from a visible which is passing away to the invisible which is being prepared for us who love him and who are waiting for his appearance. So this should be a, a growing desire or an aspiration in our hearts, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison and not looking at the things which are seen but the things which are unseen. So hard, isn't it though, to treasure the unseen. And that's what um, Hebrews 11 has told us before, and we've seen this before as well. So when you go to Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 11 rather, and if I see uh, this description of faith, the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, it tells us then that we're putting our hope in something that we have not yet seen, but it's come something that will come. And one day you will see him. And ultimately, we, as we see before then, Uh, faith, hope, and love, these three. But one day you will see him face to face and you will no longer have to live by faith. One day you will have what you're hoping for. You won't have to live in hope, but you will still have love. And so faith, hope, and love, these three, the greatest of these things is love. He says, whatever is done 
in the name of Jesus, whatever you pursue, pursue me, he says, more than the things that the world is offering you. And we can see this constant pull, holding on, clinging desperately to what we are, 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 are really losing because God in his severe mercy is taking away our toys so that he can draw us and drive us to treasure rather than tinsel. And his desire is more than what we would choose for ourselves. So I find myself constantly wrestling with these kinds of questions uh, when, when I consider uh, these, these issues of how, and these are three questions that I want us to kind of chew on for a few minutes. Um, why and how should we set up Ebenezer's in our lives? What would be that, what's an Ebenezer again? It's a stone of help, you see. What is that? A, what, what would that be for you? Would it be a remem remembrance of a thing that God did? Promises. When, what's that? Promises. promises of God and also deliverances of God. There were times when you didn't know how it was going to happen, but he's delivered you. Look back on those sacred moments where he's done something that was beyond what you might have been able to do. And when you thought things could not occur, get worse, that then he actually turns things around and does something that you or yourself couldn't do it. That's a deliverance. They didn't defeat the Philistines. It was God who defeated them. And so he can defeat the various enemies in our lives as well. But at the same time, there are going to be markers in your history of answered prayer. There are going to be times when he has delivered someone or done something and we don't understand. And there are other times when it doesn't happen, but you can still choose the way of thanksgiving because that to me is a critical and fundamental motif that I find recurring to, my, to me all the time. When I go back to Hebrews and I think about the uh, end of, 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 of this text, I say we have to, we receive, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken in this world. So we need to be grateful because that's how we offer to God a service in this life. You're not home. The promises are not in your hands yet, but ultimately you can serve them with reverence and awe. So gratitude, and I must tell you, uh, it's very easy to succumb to uh, an, an, an ungrateful heart. And therefore, one way that you mark your moments of gratitude and the deliverances for, uh, uh, to, uh, from these darkness components in our lives, and he's done various things for us, sometimes ways we can't grasp, Sometimes things we don't want, but then we look back and realize that he even used that for a larger good. You, you mark it. You build a sacred history is what I mean by an Ebenezer. Uh, the fundamental pro problem with the, uh, the theocracy, we've just talked about that, and that, that had very clearly to do with the fact that they wanted something visible rather than invisible. They wanted the now and the here rather than the God who is with them at all times Although they could not see him, they could know, love him and trust in him. And how do we treasure the seen over the unseen? And this reminds me as well of a very important text in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it speaks about this whole idea of how we've been saved, caused to be born again to a living hope. This, how many times have you put your hope in something that let you down? So here is a living hope that won't let you down. To obtain an inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This is what I have to put my heart and hope. And that's why I can choose gratitude, even though I do not like what's happening in so many ways in this, in this fallen world. Nevertheless, it's going to be revealed and we can rejoice, even though we've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of our faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not yet seen him, you can love him. That's the interesting thing. You can love him now. So let me leave you with, this, this, with these questions for a few minutes and just kind of chew on those together. We were talking about the, um, these questions about um, setting up Ebenezer's for our, for our, uh, in our lives. And I was drawing this little thing with my, the Zoom group about these little moments where I look back into the past and I see certain reminders in my past that God has delivered us from th things that we could really don't know how or why we got more than we deserved. 
But mm -hmm. those Ebenezer's are, are moments of recognition where you're building a sacred history. If God's been faithful in the past, then his promises will be good for the future as well. And so we continue to go back to who he is. And the, the theme of gratitude is critical. How do you treasure the seen over the, uh, or why do we treasure, how do we train ourselves to treasure the unseen? That's always a question, isn't it? We have to recognize that and recognize how difficult it is and how countercultural it is all the time for us to, to pursue, which is not seen. Because you realize everything seems to be falling apart as we get older, everything in our lives, we build these things up. We're gonna, we know we're, gonna, uh, we're going to age, we're going to wither. Um, and ultimately, if this is where our hope is, we're in, in great trouble. We should know that. It takes no faith to, to understand that. But at the same time, we still cling, 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 because we want the visible, the tangible, the manifest, fat manifestation of what we can touch and taste and hold. And he's training us, I believe, to come to love him for who he is. And although we haven't seen him, we can love him. And to recognize that he has given us this perspective, this hope, this purpose that transcends what we now know in our own life journeys, that, that there is this great, there's this whole idea of understanding that the glory will endure. So I, therefore, let me choose gratitude. Um, because the other day, I, I recall, I was getting myself very immersed in a, a point of view that where it was kind of the weights and the worries and the troubles of this world, as often they will try to do, will grow. And you see there's going to be the worries of this world, the, the desire for other things, um, the deceitfulness of wealth, and all its false promises are inviting me to put my hope in something that God told me never to hope in. You don't put your hope in anything other than the promises and character of God. So that at the end, that's your pursuit. And so I recognized that, and I re realized that I had gotten away from the choice of gratitude, and that's where I was with the... With the um, in our cards here, looking at the four whys of pain that I so often recur return to. The why of grumbling is never going to be profitable or helpful. It's the most common approach to pain and suffering, and it's not helpful because it assumes there's no good reason for the adversity. So that in the, uh, the, the, the revelation of Jesus, he reveals in the light what we need to hold on to when we're in our own darkness. We can express our lament and, and sorrows, and God understands that. And we cry out to him, Abba, Father, and what's happening. But at the same time, we need to choose to ask him to change us so that we are in this, being prepared for home, so that the way of guidance, what are you allowing this to do? How can I learn from it? How can I be a receptive t uh, re uh, re receiver of your truth? And then the why of gratitude. Therefore, let us choose gratitude and joy and contentment, even though they go against the grain of what's actually occurring here. I can still choose that. And that to me is a choice that we can make. It's the most important thing. So the question that we fail to, fail to ask her, uh, enough is, why have you been so good to me? That's really the biggest question. Why, what have I done? Did I deserve this? You see? And if we don't take it that way, otherwise we recognize that he is preparing you. He is treasuring you. He is preparing you for home. And your eternal citizenship with him will be far beyond anything that we can visibly imagine. We, remember we talked about the resurrected body and how God is going to transfer uh, and transform the body of our humble state into conformity to the body of his glory. And so that is our hope and promise. So when I look at the dissipation of my friends, uh, the, my loved ones, and that sort of thing, when I look at diminishments in this life, it's my reminder that you are not home, that there are, their true home is where our longing is for that which is true and right and honorable and beautiful. And that's the fullness of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you. And so we can choose the way of hope even in a hopeless world. It doesn't make sense to us, but remember that God in Scripture reveals He's so far beyond our comprehension, we can't understand a thing in the natural world. But He invites us to trust in Him, and He's given us enough light in Christ to make that very clear. 
So that gives me a real hope in this, uh, in this present darkness. Any other thoughts that you had? Yes. Um, your question about Ebenezer was kind of too far. She said, why do we have them and what can you do to set them up? And you talked about the rock. That's a physical thing. Ebenezer, are they always something physical as a reminder? Um, they're really trying to think of yeah. the things that are. I often carry things in my pockets, like little red Ebenezers. Um, like there are certain coins I've been given, or certain um, stones, or certain uh, a cross. Each and my that's the funny part because my jacket's almost and every every one of them has a different little thing. And so my my put my hand there. That what does that Ebenezer do? Oh, and you put that there to remind you of a particular occasion. You see, so you're memorializing. So that's a good way of actually doing that is to have something physical, tangible that you can actually take with you as a reminder of this incident. And so you can be very creative here rather than getting into a, into a rut. We get, very, we get very boringly routine in our, our methods. But I think one Ebenezer then would be a physical reminder that I can touch and, 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 and see that I can carry with me that reminds me of a thing that God did. That can be a very powerful thing. Could be a photograph as well. And I, someone just gave me one of those, sent me a photograph and it was a reminder of something extraordinary that had happened and I'd forgotten about how um, in, in, just incomprehensible it was. It was after this sermon I did in the uh, university, uh, rather in, in Beaufort, South Carolina, at the, um, the Parish Church of St. Helena. It was a magical day. And uh, he showed me this photo and it brought me back to that. And it's like a reminder, yes, did you forget that? This was a grace. And it was an amazing experience, these connections that we've had. And, and how many reminders do we have in this group here of things that have happened before? Yes, George. What about the wedding band and Ebenezer? That's, that wedding band it could be construed as an Ebenezer. I had a question about the gentleman said over and said that God made us with his problem. Did that the problem come from sin? Yes. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. That's all what God intended. Yeah. Sin, yeah. Yeah. So God did not make us as we are. We changed ourselves. You need to remember that because that's a unique biblical truth. If God made us as we are, we are, have a real problem. Uh, but God made us actually um, in a different condition. But because of the blast of the fall, the sin of Adam was imputed to us and it's gone generation to generation. And yet this, the new Adam actually imputes us our sin on him and gives us his righteousness. So um, it's a very different vision. It's a fallen world, but the, the biblical doctrine of the fall is gives us real hope because it says this isn't the final word. And so as I look ahead and consider then the age to come, there is a hope and a purpose.